Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bart D. Ehrman, this video will go viral. I really enjoyed this so much, and I know you will too. A Christian apologist by the name of Jonathan McClatchy has been taking pot shots at Dr. Ehrman, trying to discredit him in some of his articles, saying, well, Dr. Ehrman's sloppy, or he's not really someone to fear as a Christian when it comes to contradictions in the biblical account. And we take a detailed analysis of this, pulling graphics up thanks to people like Stephen Nelson, and we pick apart this apologist arguments. We also parallel Apollonius of Tyana to Jesus and slavery. Did Jesus condone slavery? Also, Dr. Ehrman makes his remarks about mythicism. I know some of you guys take this stuff offensive, but I'm just learning. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. We have the infamous Dr. Bart D. Ehrman with us today. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, sir. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I didn't know I was infamous, but it's nice to see you. <laughs> to a specific crowd, you're infamous. So, um, Thank you for coming to MythVision. I'm so thankful to our donors who made this possible. Super duper awesome. You guys are amazing. I can't I can't thank you enough. I'm so glad to finally make this happen and to be able to meet you, Dr. Ehrman. So I'm going to introduce you, and then we'll start getting uh, into the juicy stuff. Dr. Bart D. Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, right down the street from me. He came to UNC in 1988 after four years of teaching at Rutgers University. At UNC, he has served as both the Director of Graduate Studies and the Chair of Department Religious Studies. A graduate of Wheaton College, Illinois, Bart received both his Master's of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, where in 1985, in he did his doctoral dissertation in 1985 and was awarded magna cum laude. Since then, he has published extensively in the fields of New Testament and early Christianity, having written and edited 26 books, numerous scholarly articles, and dozens of book reviews. Among his most recent books are Greek-English edition of the Apostolic Fathers for the Loeb, Harvard University Press, a scholarly monograph on the use of literary forgery in the early Christianity, Oxford Uni University Press, and four New York Times bestsellers, Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, Jesus Interrupted, an account of scholarly views of the New Testament, and Forged, I recently finished that a month ago or so, it was really amazing, a study of the books of the New Testament that were not actually written by their alleged authors. Also, everyone right now, before we get into the juicy stuff, go down in the description, join his blog, fantastic stuff. He even has guest articles from other scholars who come on. Love the one recently wondering if Paul was writing to a sister or had a sister trying to find out. Stuff. There's so much stuff. Anyway, and, and for the Great Courses Plus, where Dr. Ehrman teaches a, num a number of courses. Make sure you guys check that out. So Dr. Ehrman, that was a lot of uh, just trying to get through the beginning because we have very limited time here. Um, here are some of our donor questions. We'll start with them. And first, we'll just call him Anonymous. Anonymous does not want his name uh, to be mentioned. But he asks, can you briefly talk about the parallels, if any, between Jesus and a contemporary Greek miracle worker, Apollonius of Tyana? Was there any borrowing between the narratives and who borrowed from who, if there was? Uh, yeah, it's a great it's a great question. So um, the, the background of the question, behind the question, is the fact that we have stories of other people besides Jesus who are uh, portrayed as miracle-working sons of God, um, who often are born because of some miracle, some supernatural event, who are um, wunderkind <laughs> children who are like religious superstars, and who um, grow up and then uh, go on itinerant preaching ministries and can heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead, and at the end of their life, they ascend to heaven. <laughs> so, <laughs> ha, sounds like Jesus. So, um, one of the uh, better known people in recent times has been uh, this figure, Apollonius of Tiana. Apollonius was not a contemporary of Jesus. He lived at the end of the first century instead of the first beginning of the first century, but he also had a miraculous birth where a, uh, a god uh, made a woman pregnant and he was born, who was a uh, religious genius as a child who, uh, when he grew up, went on a uh, preaching ministry 
teaching people that they shouldn't be concerned about the material things of life. They should be concerned about the spiritual realm. Um, who could um, who could heal the sick and uh, make the weather do what they wanted it to do, and so on. And they and raise the dead. And at the end of his life, he was brought up on charges before the Roman authorities, uh, and um, and and he. He ascended to heaven, <laughs> where he still is, <laughs> and so uh, so that's uh, so that's Apollonius and Tiana. Now, when you tell it in those general terms, it sounds just like Jesus. If you actually read the stories, it's not just like Jesus. <laughs> it's very different from Jesus in a lot of ways, lots of ways. For one thing, this guy is a Neo Pythagorean philosopher. <laughs> he's not a Jew, right. <laughs> and he's so there are lots of differences. And the mother is actually not a virgin. It's just God gets her pregnant, but she's not a virgin. So. There are lots of differences, but there are lots of similarities. And so the question is, uh, why do you have these stories? And it's, as I said, it's not just Apollonius and Jesus. I mean, you have people like this. And so I think I think the reason is because in the ancient world, if you're talking about somebody that you think is a superhuman, like he's, he's human, but he's like he's not like the rest of us. Right. There are certain kinds of stories you tell about someone like that. And these are the kinds of stories about their their miraculous birth, their miraculous life, their miraculous afterlife. And so these are the things you say. And, and one of the things you say is that this person has become a divine being. And in the ancient world, the way you become a divine being is by going up to live in the divine realm. And so the, you have these stories of ascensions up to heaven. Um, so um, the, it's tricky because Apollonius lived after Jesus, but his, uh, his account, the accounts we have, were written after the gospels. So like you might think, you know, you're not sure who's borrowing from whom here, um, but um, so it, it doesn't look like the gospels are borrowing from Apollonius, but uh, I'm not sure that Apollonius, is, the, the biographer of Apollonius is borrowing from him either. I think these are just stories that you find in the ancient world and these two people are two of them. So technically it was in the milieu, so to speak, in the air, uh, there was a common practice for, yeah things like this. Awesome. Next question, same donor. Uh, he asked if you could briefly speak about the writings of Aleutian of Samosota. And what I like about him is he's a second Socratic. So uh, this this is a guy who I guess we'd love him today, especially with the religious freedom we have. But uh, he, he's, he's arguing and writing funny, humorous stuff about superstitious people. And can you comment on that and just give us some elaborate on how yeah. this character was in the ancient world and how he affected Christians? So Lucian of Samosata was a, um, he's a, he's a skeptic and he's a satirist. So he writes satires. So if you've, um, if you've ever read Voltaire, like the French satirist Candide, who, who makes fun of religion by having religious people do stupid things, uh, Lucian of Samosata does that. And not just with religion, but also with philosophy. Um, so we have a lot of his uh, works, and they are some of them are very amusing, um, and they they poke fun at people, uh, including religious figures, including uh, one figure who um, uh, his name is Peregrinus. This figure is Peregrinus, and he is a cynic philosopher who claims that nothing in this life really matters. The material world doesn't matter. Pleasure doesn't matter. The point is to escape this world and not to be bound by material wealth or material pleasure or anything. And he, he proves that he's really committed to his message by committing suicide, by throwing himself on a, a pyre built for the purpose at one of the Olympic Games in the second century. And Lucian observes this whole thing and thinks the guy's a real shyster, even though he's killed himself to do this. And, but it turns out in, in Lucian's account of him, he became a Christian for a while. And he, he duped the Christians uh, into thinking that he was uh, like uh, the, next, the second Jesus or something. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, so you get that. And then you get other people who are shysters, who just who do magic tricks that are sleights of hand and convince people that they're miracle workers and so on. <laughs> so Lucian's making fun of a lot because he's, he's skeptical about everything like that. He's a terrific source for understanding um, early Christianity and for understanding some of the New Testament, uh, but it's also just really fun to read. So people who are interested in this kind of thing, Lucian of Samosata, it's great, great reading. Thank you, Dr. Ehrman. This is an interesting question. Do you think Morton Smith forged the secret gospel of Mark? 
Okay, so like this would take two hours to answer. Um, <laughs> we got like know, two minutes. Yeah, well, see, I don't know what your reader, your listeners would know about the secret gospel. So Morton, I'll do it in two minutes. So uh, Morton Smith was a brilliant scholar who taught at Columbia University, one of the most brilliant scholars of early Christianity in modern times. Um, during the Second World War as a young man, he was uh, isolated in Israel. He was there checking out the archaeology and such and got stuck there during the war, couldn't get out because of the war. And he spent some time in a monastery called uh, Marsaba Monastery outside of Jerusalem, about 12 miles out of Jerusalem. Um, he later, and he realized they have this really great library there, but there are no books that are, the books are in there, but there's no, no catalog of the books. Years later, he went back. Uh, he had a research lead from Columbia, and he went back to catalog their books just so they'd know what's in there because there's an old manuscripts and books. And he's going through a book, um, a particular book written in the 17th century that's the writing of one of the church fathers. It has some blank pages at the back. And inside the blank pages is a handwritten, four pages of handwriting that um, looks like it's written sometime in the 18th century. He can judge from the, he's a Greek scholar, and he, um, thinks it's an 18th century hand. He doesn't have time to do it because he's trying to catalog all these books during his leave. So he just takes photographs of it. When he goes back after his leave and he reads, looks at these photographs, he realizes this claims to be a letter written by a famous church father, Clement of Alexandria, who lived around the year 200, who claims that he knew of a different edition of the Gospel of Mark, a secret Gospel of Mark that was kept secret. And this secret gospel of Mark, among other things, has an episode in which a young man comes to Jesus during his ministry wearing nothing but a linen cloth over his nakedness. Mm. And Jesus spends, baptizes him and spends the night with him, teaching him the mysteries of the kingdom of God. <laughs> They're teaching Smith, the mysteries, all right. Smith, yeah. Yeah, this thing, Smith thinks there's more than some kind of spiritual mysteries going on here, and that it's a homoerotic scene. And so he wrote two books about it. One, a very scholarly book, it's a very, very impressive, on Clement of Alexandria and the Secret Gospel of Mark. And the other is a popular book, just called, I think it's just called The Secret Gospel of Mark. Scholars, scholars verified that um, these photographs are authentic. They verified that the handwriting is, in fact, from the 18th century. They verified that the style of the of the letter would it would be looks like it is a copy of Clement of Alexandria's writings because it's very much like Clement's writings, and the quotations from the Secret Mark sound a lot like our Gospel of Mark. Hmm. And there are a number of people who think that Morton Smith forged it. Right. And so um, the question is, what do I think? I What's tend to think opinion? I tend to think he forged it. Okay. But it's a minority. It's a minority opinion within scholarship. I think the majority of scholars think that it's authentic. Well, um, but I think I think he forged it. I think he probably. I'm not definite about it. Like I'm not right. gonna. Like, it's not gonna be my, you know bet my house on it. But I that's my guess. Thank you, based, based on a long study of it. I appreciate it. What was the growth rate of Christianity during its earliest decades? I know you've written on this extensively, but uh, if you don't mind, just give a minute even uh, explaining that and. Uh, We'll get into how many converts you think defected from the movement once the promises made by Jesus and Paul regarding the Messiah's return failed. But first, let's talk about the growth rate real quick. And then I have something interesting I want to poke in on that next one. So in my book on Triumph of Christianity, I try to estimate the growth rate of Christianity if it started out. As the New, the New Testament says, that right after Jesus' death, there were 11 men, male disciples following him, and there was a handful of women with, him, with them in Jerusalem. So there are about 20 people to start, That's, and I think that's probably right, who, who first believed in the resurrection. By the year 300, there are probably two or three million Christians. Wow. And so people used to say, well, it must be a miracle. How do you get from 20 people to three million? <laughs> it's a miracle. Or people say there must have been like these massive evangelistic rallies where like, you know, like Billy Graham is down there and, you know, 5,000 convert on one day. How else are you going to get there? Um, so... Um, a sociologist of religion named Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And, he, and sociologists really know how to crunch demographics, numbers. And so he crunched the numbers and said, you know, you don't need a miracle and you don't need massive conversions. What you need is a steady growth rate. And he estimated that if you grow from at a rate of about 40% a decade, 
you'd get there. So in my book on Triumph of Christianity, I discuss Stark's work and I show why there are problems with his numbers. And I recrunch the numbers and it's not significantly different. The growth rate over time would be about 35% growth rate. And what happens is it's an exponential curve. It's like if um, you invest money, you know, you're making 7% and, you know, every year you're not making much. You're saving seven bucks for every hundred dollars. But if the hundred dollars is a million dollars, you're making money hand over fist at the same rate. Right. So the money goes way up. And that's how it is with population growth. So the entire period is about 35 percent, but it has to be much slower at the end and it has to be much faster at the beginning. Because if it's only if it's only 35 percent a decade, uh, you know, then after uh, after 10 years, those 20 people, people have become, you know, 27 people. <laughs> There's clearly more than 27 Christians in the world. You know, and so when Paul writes the letter to the Corinth in the 50s, you know, there are more than 40 Christians and there but 40 Christians wow. in the church of Corinth. And so, so there's, it's much faster at the beginning and much slower at the end in order to make it work. What is the rate? I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's a guess. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. And this is a technical question, I guess. I don't want to spend too much time because we've got some interesting apologist stuff we will get to, but I want to spend time on the donors' questions. And this one personally has my interest. How many converts do you think defected from the movement once the promises made by Jesus and Paul regarding the Messiah's return failed? And what were, because this is important to ask, and you do this in your, you lecture this all the time and say in your college courses, you ask people to show the difference between Paul's teachings and Jesus' teachings and stuff. So the real question comes down to, there's obviously a failed apocalyptic promise of some sort. What was Jesus's promise? And then Paul has a Messiah that's resurrected and has a returning Jesus. I very much doubt Jesus is on land going, all right, guys, I'm going to die and actually come back. So what promises did Jesus or the original movement in your best uh, educated guess would be on what he's saying? And then Paul's and how many people do you think defected when no return and no actual uh, parousia, if you will, occurred? So I think Jesus definitely did predict that a cosmic judge that he called the son of man was going to come back while his disciples were still alive. So within his generation, uh, Paul, um, who Paul probably converted three or four years after Jesus' death, and he expected Jesus to come back within his generation. He thought he would be alive. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 1, Thess 1 Corinthians 15, he, Jesus, Paul thinks, seems to think he's going to be alive when Jesus returns. It doesn't happen. So um, there's been some very interesting studies about what happens when you've got a religious group or some other kind of group that has a very firm expectation of something that is going to happen that doesn't happen, and um, if if you if you if you read your listeners want to listen read something really cool about it, it's uh, it's called uh, when prophecy fails by I Leon Festinger. Have you read it? I Fantastic. have it. I'm halfway through it right now. Oh, Fantastic! My gosh. Great. So it's about UFO cult, as you know, who are expecting you know the Venetians or the Martians or somebody to come on this particular date to take them out of the world, and the end doesn't come. And this this author, who's a social social psychologist, has infiltrated the group to figure out what what are they going to do. You would think what they do is they give up and say, "Oh, we're wrong about that." <laughs> no, <laughs> some did, but the other thing that happened that's more striking is that the group became more evangelistic. They reset the date and try to get more converts. And Festinger has a psychological explanation for it. It has to do with a phenomenon that he, he named. Uh, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when you've got a belief that can be confirmed, that is confirmed. So there's dissonance between what you know is going to happen and what you know did happen. You thought you knew it was going to happen. What you do know did happen. There's a dissonance there. What happens? If you get more people to agree with you on this belief, it eases your feeling, feeling bad that it didn't happen. It makes you think, oh, I was right. I just got the date wrong, you know. And so, and so you go out and get more evangelistic. Christians appear to have gone out and gotten more evangelistic. <laughs> that makes sense. So some people certainly would have dropped from the movement, but we don't have any numbers. We we um, for any we we don't have numbers for defections at all throughout 
Christian history. So we don't know. We just don't know. Interesting. And I suspect when the Gentiles find their way in, then that's when things actually are more successful. Paul, Paul, I think, kept the thing alive. I, I just very much doubt if it stuck. I, that's just my opinion. But anyway, I don't want to no. get trapped there. No, 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 no. I, no, I don't think if Paul hadn't come along, Paul didn't invent the idea that Jesus' death and resurrection is what brings salvation. Right. People get that wrong. They think Paul was the founder of Christianity. And that, that view was around before Paul converted. That's why he was persecuting Christians, because they're saying yeah. that. And he thought it was nonsense. But what his conversion was all about was realizing that this salvation to the Jews can go to Gentiles without them having to become Jews. Mm -hmm. And so men don't have to get circumcised. And so and Christianity is not following Jesus is not a Jewish sect for Paul. And so that opened up the floodgates. And, yeah, if that hadn't happened, Christianity would would not have anything like the success it's had. If we had more time, I would like probe you to ask you like specific details about Paula Fredrickson. Like, like I would love to get your insight because uh, it's just something of mine. But I suspect, uh, I don't know. I, 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 we'll save that for a future interview if everyone wants right. to hear your views on different scholarships of Paul within Judaism because I'm just fascinated. And your student, I believe one of your students, Dr. Jason Staples, uh, fingers crossed I can get him on to promote his new book that's coming out on uh, a new look on Israel. But uh, He will be happy to join you. I would I would bet my house on that. <laughs> I hope so, because I want to learn from him. There's so many groups. And by the way, this whole second coming thing with cognitive dissonance, there's a group called uh, Full Preterist. Are you aware of them? Call, I'm sorry, called what? Full Preterist. Well, they I know what the Preterist view is, yeah. They, well, they're like full. They think that everything was fulfilled, the parasy, the second coming, resurrection, but they interpret yeah. it to mean, oh, that's covenantal language or that's allegory. Well, that's not really cosmic. In Anyway, we, we've yeah. got to do more shows. So ladies and gentlemen, Make sure you guys make that happen sometime. Anyway, next question, Dr. Ehrman. I'm I'm just excited to have you on here. Um, my, my really good friend, Anthony Guthrie, he, he helped make this possible with a substantial donation. And thank you, my friend. Here are his uh, questions. What do we know about the historical practice of slavery in the first century, especially the inheritance of foreign slaves who could be beaten to an extent without recourse? And I want to follow through with all that he has to say on this because you'll get the tone of what he's trying to ask. Yahweh, the author of the epistle of James and Jesus in the Gospels, all seem to intend for the old laws to be upheld forever, including those regarding slavery. When Jesus states in Matthew 5 that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, how was this used to justify the transatlantic slave trade? And does it seem that the, the character of Jesus ever really envisioned a world without slavery? So he has, just like some of the guys I've been interviewing, the scholars, they point out that what slavery was, was actual slavery. A lot of fundamentalist Christians make it, oh, it's only indentured servitude. And they don't realize the cruelty in the Hebrew Bible or the, or even in the ancient Near East. Was Jesus upholding the same concepts of slavery? First question, I guess. It's a complicated question. It turns out not to be an easy one. Um, and one of the reasons it's complicated is because uh, slavery was a, a major institution throughout antiquity that virtually nobody questioned per se. Um, it wasn't seen as an ethical issue throughout in the Roman Empire. Um, the other reason it's complicated is because it wasn't like American slavery. American slavery um, had everything to do with race mm -hmm. and ancient slavery had nothing to do with race. Um, and it's true that foreign slaves could be beaten without, you know, without penalty, but any slave could be beaten without penalty. You, a slave was the property of their owner. Um, these were not indentured servants. Um, the word in Greek for slave that gets used in the New Testament is doulos. Um, it's the word that Paul uses uh, of himself, that he's a doulos of Christ. He's the slave of Christ, meaning Christ is his owner and Christ can do anything he wants with him. Mm -hmm. um, even though that was the case, slavery was a very complicated institution in antiquity because there were slaves on numerous levels. We had some slaves who were sent to the slave mine, to the salt mines. You know, their life expectancy would be about two years or something. It was like, it was, no, it was very bad, very bad, very bad. Um, uh, but there are other slaves who were um, welcome members of upper elite households who were highly educated scholars who um, 
or highly educated businessmen and business women and who were well placed and well treated and well dressed and well fed. And so it's not like there was a thing, slavery. There's this wide range of things, um, but it always involved um, somebody belonging to someone else, uh, not as an indentured servant, but actually being there, there being owned by them um, for whatever purpose they wanted to use them for. Um, a large percentage of the population, I forget what the numbers are, but like a third of the population in Rome was slave, were slaves. Um, uh, it wasn't based on race. A lot of people, there were various ways to become enslaved. Um, if you were born into slavery, you yourself were, in other words, your parents were both slaves and you were born as a slave. Uh, a lot of slaves were provided by wars. And so prisoners of war would typically be made slaves. Um, uh, you could be sold into slavery if you if you owed uh, debt you weren't able to pay. You uh, could be you 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 were your own collateral <laughs> collateral. You would could become a slave. So there are all sorts of ways to becoming slaves. Uh, but again, it wasn't based on race or it was based on factors like that. The ones I've just mentioned. And I um, guess that oh sorry. I was just going to say Jesus did not oppose the institution of slavery. Either did Paul. Jesus. Um, but, you know, that shouldn't seem weird. Nobody opposes the institution of slavery. I mean, we have we have authors who are slaves. They don't oppose the institution of slavery. It's just the way things are. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's just, and so that, I don't know that it occurred to much of anybody. I mean, slaves didn't want to be enslaved, and slaves could be set free, of course. I mean, an uh, owner could set free somebody that they thought well of or that they appreciated or that they were paid off or, you know, and so, so it was a fluid institution, but it definitely was slavery. Uh, and there were there was there were some nasty things that happened. Was there was ask. also, though, you know, it turns out. Sorry, sorry but it turns out that in many ways, uh, in the ancient world, um, in many times and places, it was better to be a slave than to be a poor free person, hmm. because uh, the slave, at least, the the master has a reason for feeding the slave to make sure that they're uh, fed enough and healthy because this is their hired labor. <laughs> and if the person dies, they've lost an asset. The impoverished person doesn't have any backup plan. And so they're often seen as worse off than slaves. Interesting. I guess the final thing I'd like to say is, was this whole um, Matthew 5 with Jesus to fulfill the law and the prophets, was this just like a used verse or passage to justify transatlantic slave trade? Um, I mean, we know that like the Southern slave owners in America, for example, would use Bible verses sometimes to like, you know, use their, oh, well, slavery's thumbs up, you know. I don't know about Matthew 5 during the slave trade. It'd be, wor it'd be worth finding out. But it, Matthew 5 itself um, is a complicated passage. It's not. So, but you're not asking what it really means. You're asking how was it used, right, and right. I don't, I don't really, I don't know how it was used during the slave trade. It, I, it doesn't ring a bell as being the most common thing, though, because, you know, you have other things that would be more appropriate. Um, the one that was used a lot, for example, was the uh, the curse of Ham uh, in the Old Testament, where in the story of of uh, Noah's three sons, um, who uh, who one of whom Ham saw Noah uh, naked when he was stone drunk. And and Noah realized that he'd been shamed in front of his son and he cursed his son Canaan. And in the 19th century, as they develop uh, race theories, anthropologists developed race theories that you have these races and there some have some qualities, some have other. The thought came to be that the uh, what they called at the time the Negroid race came from uh, came from Ham. And that since it was that race was cursed, that meant that white folk were justified in enslaving black folk. Hmm. Uh, and so that was a very common room. But Matthew 5, I'm not aware of, but it just might be my ignorance. Well, thank you, Anthony, for those questions so much. Another donor says, I have a special request. Dr. Airman, please blink twice, twice if you're secretly a mythicist. Uh, <laughs> Would you like to comment? Look, his eyes some, opened up even more. I'm going to get some toothpicks. <laughs> no, I think the mythicists are completely wrong. And, they, you know, 
And I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. Does everybody know what a mythicist is on your program? Yeah, everyone, yeah, pretty much. So, um, look, you're just doing yourself a disservice because people who are not mythicists are laughing at you. You're, you're ignoring historical evidence in order to assert a point. And you might think it's great, but it's like, you know, look, if you're a big fan of Fox News or of MSNBC, you think it's great. But anybody who's not, who listens to this, says this is just crazy. And to, look, I'm, I'm a fan of MSNBC, I'm, but, you know, I, I, I'm a liberal. But, but, you know, the evidence is so overwhelming that I'm just like, why, why, why not argue something that is going to make a difference instead of like trying? So I know why people do it. They like to get a name from themselves or they like to get a book published or they like having a following. And then it's cool to say Jesus never existed, but it's just bollocks to quote my English wife. <laughs> could, could we, and by any, by any chance before we leave this one to the next question, is it possible to say that some of the academic mythicists aren't on the same playing field as some of the guys who are, let's say, coming up with really, really, really out there theories that don't even – go into the vein of academia at all. Like for, for example, Dr. Richard Carrier, Dr. Robert McNair Price, would they be, you don't equate them to Holocaust deniers the same way you would someone else, right? Not generally. Cause I mean, those when, guys, yeah, they know a lot, but they know a lot, but they're completely wrong on this. Have you seen my debate with Robert yes. Price? Yes. So, yes. I mean, I just think they're completely wrong and Carrier, you know, Carrier's a smart enough fellow, um, but I think he does himself a disservice. He know he knows all. He's published, you know, he's got published, you know, a, an article or two in a peer-reviewed journal. He he brags about how many things he publishes in peer-reviewed journals, but I mean, it's not like a big deal. This is what scholars do. But you know, there's nobody there. There is no professor of New Testament in the world that I know of in a, an accredited university, and there are thousands of people like this who's a mythicist. I don't I don't know. Uh, do you know of one? I don't know of one. I am not aware. I mean, and that's not an accident. And it's not, you know, they say, well, they're prejudiced against us. Well, they're prejudiced against you for the same reason that the biology department is prejudiced against somebody who doesn't believe in evolution, but believes in Adam and Eve. They, they think you don't have any evidence. And so, but, you know, they get offended when I say that. I know they get offended, but I'm just telling you the reality is this is, this is the problem. So why not, why not like use your intelligence to, it, I don't know what your goal. I don't know what the goal is. I don't know what the goal is, but because um, right. I never really kind of asked them the goal. But if the goal is to to help to help people realize that Christianity is not true, you're not going to get there by saying things that people are just going to think are silly. You know, I I have to make a comment, and then we'll get to the next question. Is there's a group that thinks that all Paul's Gentiles are actually secretly lost Israelites, and so I'm like, and they go, well, this disproves Christianity. I'm like. You're never going to convince, first of all, with Greek and linguistics and experts. They all disagree with you. But number two is you think this is going to convince them? Anyway, yeah. there's so much more, Dr. Ehrman, that I can't even begin. We don't have the time. Uh, and if we if we thought we did, we'd be practicing cognitive dissonance. So <laughs> <laughs> we discover we had it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Textual criticism. This is uh, – <laughs> How do I say this? Apologist. We're going to be talking about this. So before I get into the key stuff, I'd like to cover, I just want to make sure our viewers get a very brief introduction to some of the basic of, uh, basics of textual criticism, since a few of these topics are going to come up during our discussion. My friend, Stephen Nelson, you're the man, has put together some illustrations for all of the stuff we're going to be going over. And thanks for the illustrations, man. I'm going to pull up one that, that he made to start the conversation off which is an illustration of B.H. Streeter's theory of local text. And so let me pull this up real quick. I apologize. Do, you, do, you, do your listeners know what you're talking about? Uh, I don't think half of them <laughs> will. Let me do okay. this. Just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> so let me read this and then get your thoughts. Can you explain in broad terms what all, the, all this represents in, term, in terms text types and the transmission of the New Testament? And can you also explain what the coherence-based genealogical ah. method is? I know you're going to love this. I know you're going to love this. No, and I'm going to explain that. I'm telling you. Well, I'm going to try. I'm just trying. It. It. <laughs> and how it's changing the way textual critics conceive of text types and the role they play in reconstruction text. And by the way, you're going to hate me. Ready? 
Try to do it in less than five minutes. <laughs> All right, okay. You know, so, okay. So I want you to explain quantum physics in five <laughs> minutes or less. Please. And make it simple so everybody can understand. Okay. Don't use any complicated language here. <laughs> I know, right? <sighs> okay. Um, so, okay. So is everybody seeing this chart? I think so. So B.H. Street, it was, um, so uh, early 20th century, a major scholar of the Gospels, Brit, um, he is building on the theory uh, developed most uh, convincingly by uh, uh, Westcott and Hort, who were two uh, Cambridge scholars uh, in the 1880s, who published their work in the 1880s. The logic of this chart is that you have different different forms of the New Testament in circulation in different parts of the Christian world in the early centuries. By different forms of the New Testament, I mean that scribes are copying the New Testament in Alexandria, Egypt, in North Africa, in the city of Caesarea. They're, you know, different scribes in different places are copying the text. And in every place, scribes are making mistakes and they're sometimes changing things on purpose. The changes made in one place tend to stay in that place because that's where the other scri their successor scribes are copying them. And so a certain way, a certain form of the text that's worded in a certain way. So you take John chapter one, there'll be differences in the way it's worded in Alexandria and in Caesarea and in Antioch in Italy, depending on the changes that scribes have made and then reproduced in that locale. The argument uh, of Streeter is that you can isolate these various local texts and that over time, as Christianity grew and spread, the textual traditions of one place came to affect the textual traditions of other places. Until by the end of the fourth century, you end up with a text that was kind of an amalgamated text of these various locations that is not particularly close to what the original looked like because it's an amalgamation of local texts in various places that have all been smashed together into one kind of more, one text that there is being seen as improved, but in fact has all sorts of changes in it because of where it came from. That's called the Byzantine text. That became the text of the Greek New Testament throughout the Middle Ages. And it is the form of the text that then was used as the basis for the King James translation. So that the King James translation is based on a form of the text that is a late and inferior form of the text to find out what the text looked like in the earlier centuries before the Byzantine text, you have to isolate the Alexandrian text and the Caesarean text and, the, and so forth and so on. So a quick question on that is, do we have, uh, or I might be wrong about this, do we, we don't have Jerome's Vulgate, do we? I think only later copies that are corrupt, corrupt correct? We don't have the original thing that Jerome did. And Jerome actually didn't do the entire Vul the Vulgate. He wrote, he did the Gospels, but... And so we don't have the originals of uh, the Greek New Testament or the originals of the Vulgate or the originals of translations, versions done in Syriac or Coptic or Armenian or none of these languages. So what we have in all of them are copies that have been made that have been changed either by mistake, by accident or on purpose. And the trick of textual criticism is to figure out among all these manuscripts which which reading of this verse is the right is the one that was originally written John 1 18 what was it what did it originally said when the author wrote it and how was it changed and why was it changed that's what textual critics do and Streeter was a old old style textual critic it was very good for what he did he's not genealogical based <laughs> he is um, genealogically based but oh, he's not he He's not the coherence-based genealogical method. No, okay. he's genealogical. The whole thing is a genealogy because you're drawing a family tree. Okay, got and it. So you're drawing a genealogy, and so that's what that exactly is what he's doing. But that's not what the uh, <laughs> genealogical-based coherence. I mean, yeah. I would hope that maybe we can have another time to do this. Of course, to delve into getting your thoughts on this theory. Of course, and and but I know the coherence-based. Like, no, I'm telling you, the coherence based genealogical method is not something that you're going to be able to explain in five minutes. I know. Yeah, maybe one day. That's what I'm and saying. Nobody's going to care. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, modern, it's not going to make any sense. I mean, I'm just telling you. Yeah. There, there are very few textual critics who can actually understand it. 
Well, lim- modern evangelicals like to use the catchphrase embarrassment of riches to describe the vast quantity of copies of the New Testament we have. But most Christians throughout history didn't have an embarrassment of riches, right? Why do, why do you think it's important to modern Christians to believe that scholars have finally restored the so-called original text, considering most Christians throughout history had Bibles full of errors? And how close do you think we are currently to the original text? These are really good questions, and they're, they're again, very difficult. Um, it only gets I, worse from here. <laughs> the, I don't know of any bona fide scholars who think we have in every detail the original text. Even, you know, I've, I've debated Dan Wallace a number of times, and, you know, he, and he has a, a more optimistic view of things than I do, but he agrees. There are passages where we don't know, or where, no, I can change it. There are passages where we wholeheartedly disagree. I don't mean me and Dan. I mean, everybody in the field disagrees. Is it worded this way or that way? This way or that way? There are tons of verses like that. Dan would agree with that. Um, uh, so we don't know. Um, the question is how close are we? And the embarrassment of riches is all about the fact that there are more manuscripts of the New Testament than for any other book from the ancient world, flat out. And you know, people raise this with me as this like I didn't know this. Uh, yeah, this is this is right. It's completely common knowledge. It's true. And it's no, it's not an accident, it's true, it's not a miracle, it's true. Who's copying books throughout most of Western history? Monks and monasteries <laughs> until about the 16th century. That was it. And so, so what books are they going to copy? Are they more likely to copy Paul's letters or Plato's dialogue? <laughs> what do you think? Paul was scripture for them. So of course they cover copied Paul's letters more. And so, yes, of course, we have more. That is true. It's also true that as a result of that, we have far more textual differences in the New Testament than for any other book from the ancient world. So many that scholars have not been able to count them all. The latest estimates say that there are up to 500,000 differences in our manuscripts, half a million differences. Now, what, what people get upset with me is when I say that, but then I go on to say, which is also absolutely true, the vast majority of these don't matter for squat. They don't. They, like, scribes can't spell. Every time you misspell a word, it's a difference. Okay, well, who cares? I don't really care much. But I mean, so that's that's absolutely true. But there are some big differences. And that's and what I want to yeah. Our time is so, so limited. I'd love to just yeah. squeeze more out of you. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, so have you ever heard of a, a, a Christian apologist, Jonathan McClatchy? I don't recall. So he's a Christian apologist, of course, who has actually written articles, and this is what he says. In 2000, or in 2020, a Christian apologist named Jonathan McClatchy published three um, scathing blog articles criticizing Jesus Interrupted for alleged misrepresentations and distortions, which you can go down in the description and check out all three of these articles for yourself. We won't have time to address all of his criti- cri- critiques, sorry, but I've picked out certain examples that I think might be interesting to discuss. And of course, you'll get right You'll know exactly where we're going with this, and I'll have images and everything. So homo teluton, that's one heck of a word. I'd like to start with one example in particular that I think is really interesting. McClatchy quoted a paragraph from Jesus Interrupted, which he evidently copied manually. And in doing so, he left out a huge chunk of a sentence. Before we address his critique, let's just correct the record and clarify how and why McClatchy's quotation differs from the original text of your book. So let me pull this image up. (laughs) <laughs> from uh who, who is this guy he's a christian apologist uh i'd say he's on the up and coming when it comes to um you know can you see that by the way i, just, I can see it okay so in he says he's quoting you right in matthew it says this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased and ultimately if, if you don't mind me i'm gonna go he says uh mcclatchy's omission is rather striking since it demonstra- it's demonstrably false, because it comes out where it says, I am t- taking here the original wording of the verse as found in most English translation. And you actually say the opposite when he's trying to scathe you in his article, but it's a mistake. Uh, so the textual variant is not actually in most English translations. And if anyone bothers to, ch- to fact check this quote, they'll find that you actually stated the opposite. And so with that opposite... Makes you guys, you can go back and pause this video if you want to see the screenshot. Wait, put, sure. put, put it back up again. Put it up okay. Again. 
Whoops. Because I want to point something out about it. Yes, sir. Hold on. Let me pull that one back up. I apologize. I ended up uh, closing that. One second. I believe we're there. Yes. Yes, sir. I see. You're saying it's home. I tell you, Tom, because the word found occurs twice. And you, yes. you're, suspecting, you're suspecting that his eye skipped. Are those on? Are they on subsequent lines in the book? Yes, and I'm about to show you the second image, which actually points this even better for us, real quick here. And I, I love this because this is the perfect example from someone like him who's actually trying to scathe you. This is exactly in the vein of what you're trying to say. So, oh, no, but see, he could he could claim it was an accident, but I'm not. Yeah, it well, may it was, have been an accident. I mean, may, no, it, no, it may have. It may. It looks like it could well have been an accident. But it's we want to catch possible, that. It's also possible that he did it on purpose. Interesting, because a lot of Christians listen to him. And I think it's important we get into some of the juicy stuff where he's trying to say your contradiction claims aren't valid. And, and it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. But I wanted everyone to see, including McClatchy, I hope you see this, that uh, you have also fallen into the same situation where mistakes happen. And this is right in the vein of Dr. Bart Ehrman's work. So I ask all the Christians who are afraid of Bart Ehrman, Continue to be afraid, okay? <laughs> I'm just teasing. In his article, he says, uh, don't be afraid of the big bad wolf, Bart Ehrman. You know, like he goes into all this. So we're going to go into the voice at Jesus' baptism. McClatchy's you know, the the yes. stuff I'm saying, by the way, is like there's almost nothing in these books that I came up with. Nothing. Almost nothing in the books he's talking about. Misquoting Jesus, that's all just common knowledge. So it's just people get upset with me because, I mean, scholars have known this stuff for centuries. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. Seriously. Uh, so we're going to talk about the voice at Jesus baptisms and his objection is that the textual variant you cited is highly contested. Do you actually believe that today I have begotten you is the original reading of Luke 3 22. Can you elaborate on this? And let me pull up the image for everyone who's uh, watching to get aware of the particular passage. And, um, Hope you could see that. Can you explain what it means when the textual apparatus? Or we're, we're we're leaving that. So let me have you comment first on this. Today so, I have begotten you, and you believe this comes, I believe, from the, is it the Eastern text or the? No, we don't do it that way anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, you it'd be called the Western text. Um, yes. So, um, all right. So here's the deal. Uh, did he get this out of my Jesus Interrupted book? I believe so, so. Yeah. So, so, okay. The, the deal is this, you know, I was, I was um, in the course of that argument, I was trying to make a point about things and I wasn't trying to prove anything about Luke three twenty two. If you want, if he wants to, I don't know if he reads scholarly works or not. If he does read scholarship, then I would suggest he look at my discussion of this passage in my book, the Orthodox corruption of scripture, because I have an extensive, argument for why the text originally said, today I have begotten you, um, from Psalm 2-7. Um, it is found, it's found only in Codex Bize, as he says. Um, um, uh, I, well, he doesn't actually say that, but that is where it's only found. It's found in Codex Bize and in a group of Latin manuscripts. And so usually that's thought of as a Western variation that you know, people look at, but usually they think, yeah, probably not. But you have to look at the other evidence. Mm -hmm. And the most striking thing is when this verse gets quoted in early church fathers prior to any of our manuscripts, this is the form of the text they have. So that's why even if it's wacky and crazy stuff comes up in those. Well, it's not wacky and crazy because church fathers thought that this was accurate. And, it's, and it's not. And it's not. Um, you can see why there's a big argument. See, it isn't just like, oh, is it in, you know, 200 manuscripts versus one manuscript? Yeah, that's that's how you argue if you're not trained. But I mean, if you actually know anything about this field, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> the way it the way it works is you mount an argument based both on which manuscripts have it, how many, not so much how many manuscripts, have, what the quality of the manuscripts are, what the date of the manuscripts are, but also which is the author more likely to have written given everything else we know about his theology, his word usage. Uh, you do a whole analysis of the verse in light of all of Luke and Acts, and then you decide which of these two variant readings, you've got two different ways of reading, which one is a scribe more likely to have uh, wanted to change. Mm. 
Good point. And so, like, and and what evidence do you have for that? So it's a lengthy argument. And so if I gave an argument like that, every time I mentioned Luke 3.22, every book of mine would be 20 times larger than it is. So of course I don't say this every time. Just if you really want to see the argument, don't, don't look at a book where I don't give the argument. Read my argument. And if you disagree with my argument, let me hear about it. I mean, because it's not, I'm not saying that it's definitely, you know, I'm just saying the probability is this. And it's not a weird claim at all. Thank you, this Dr. Is, this, is what, this is what scholars say. I mean, I'm not, you know, there are debates about this verse. Yeah, yeah. And by yeah, the yeah. way, if he thinks that we have the original text, why do experts disagree on this verse? Right. What are they disagreeing on? Great point. Matthew's dual donkeys. McClatchy quotes <laughs> Jesus interrupted, and this is a good one. In Matthew, Jesus' disciples procure two animals for him, a donkey and a colt. They spread their garments over the two of them, and Jesus rode into town straddling them both, Matthew 21, 7. It's an odd image, but Matthew made Jesus fulfill the prophecy of Scripture quite literally. McClatchy claims that Matthew is indicating that Jesus sat on the cloaks, not that he sat on both the donkeys and the colt and the uh, the donkey and the colt at the same time. In fact, he points out since the colt has had never been ridden, the mother donkey is actually there for some kind of moral support. <laughs> and so let me pull up this That's image good. for you. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay, it's, moral support. We like that. Yeah. All right. And here is the parallel to the passages. And if, I think if you look at the bottom of these, it's really interesting between each of these. Uh, Matthew has it in plural. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed them on their cloaks. And then here it says, they brought the colt, singular, to Jesus and threw it on it, singular, their cloaks, and he sat on it, singular. But um, Matthew's clearly adding the colt's mother in the scene where Luke ad adheres closely to Mark, who has only one animal. You can see that Matthew converts all the singular references to plural, and it seems like he needs two animals to fulfill prophecy. Apparently, Christian apologists are totally fine with Jesus walking on water, but they draw the line at Jesus riding two donkeys. Do you think McClatchy's interpretation is reasonable? Can you elaborate on Matthew's use of Zechariah 9.9? And I'll bring up that image if you'd like to elaborate. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what translation this is that he's using. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this RSV here, and this is not him. This is actually my buddy who's oh. uh, who put this image together, Stephen Nelson. But um, are you seeing any conflicts there already? Or I'm, I'm just having a little trouble understanding. In in um, I'm a little understanding. So. So the, the, the apologist is simply trying to say that he didn't ride on two donkeys. He rode on one. No, I, just, I, I got that part. Okay. I'm yes, just sir. trying to understand his argument that he's not sitting on the donkeys. So in, in Mark right here, the way that he's trying to argue this, and maybe you can talk about the Greek. Okay, look. Okay, yeah, I mean, let me just put it like this. Even if you go with his argument that he's not sitting, they have put yeah, the cloaks – on the two animals, whatever the whatever he's sitting on is plural. He's sitting on the cloaks, but if the cloaks are on both animals, he's not sitting on some of the cloaks. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the 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 I guess you'd say the referent the antecedent here is. Um, no, I get it. No, I get it. You're right well, that it's. The cult, but he's trying to say it's the. No, I get cult. it. No, he's saying they spread the cloaks on. He's sitting on the cloaks. Yeah, I get it. But they put the cloaks on both. On, he's sitting on whatever they've. In his view, they're, they're he's sitting on the things they spread over the cloak, over the colt and the donkey. Right. Right. They spread them over both of them. So if he's actually sitting on the things that were put on the colt and the donkey, then he's sitting on both the colt and the donkey because the cloaks are on both the colt and the donkey. <laughs> what, what about Zechariah? Look, look, this is not look, this is not my argument anyway. If you want it, one of the most one of the best commentaries on the Gospel of, uh, of Matthew, written in modern times, is by John Meyer, a senior a professor of uh, New Testament, he's retired now from Notre Dame, who's also written the most massive study of the historical Jesus, and this is his argument. And uh, you know. Just about everybody agrees with the argument. They just have different. They just say, "Well, you know, they, that uh, you know, it's it's metaphorically or something." But you know, it's 
it looks like he's sitting on a cold in the donkey. So whatever. So I guess a simple question would be in light of the Zechariah thing, do you, um, was the author Matthew simply misrepresenting the Greek translation or do you think he could actually read the Hebrew text? What was the point of Matthew's going out of his way to add the second animal to the scene, if not to fulfill prophecy? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking Just, because Zechariah has, but has two animals. Right. And I think that's why the simple question is, isn't that why Matthew's using two animals instead of Mark's singular animal? Yes. Yeah. No, the whole point is, is that when Zechariah uses the two animals, so Zechariah is using a, a, um, a, a, poet, a poetic form called synonymous parallelism, where, and you find this throughout the entire, I mean, all the poetry of the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, they'll, they'll, state, they'll state something in one line, and then they'll give the same idea in the next line with different words. So they're not rhyming, you know, they're not rhyming words at the end of the sentence. They're kind of rhyming ideas. And so Zechariah is doing that. And so the first line and the second line are parallel to each other. So everything that he says in the first line, he says in the second line using different words. And the point is that Matthew seems to, in this case, think to be a literal interpretation of this. He's got to have both animals, even though they're supposed to be synonymous, the same animal. And so the point is, is that he, uh, Matthew has taken something literally that was meant to be poetic. Interesting. Thank you. Next topic. When was this the current? When was the curtain in the temple ripped? Uh, McClatchy quotes Jesus interrupted. According to Mark's gospel, after Jesus breathes his last, the curtain of the temple is torn in half. Luke's gospel also indicates that the curtain in the temple was ripped in half. Oddly enough, it does not rip after Jesus dies, but it is explicitly said to rip while Jesus is still alive and hanging on the cross. McClatchy asks rhetorically, but is that what the text of Mark and Luke says? So here is an image. I, I like to give the visuals uh, to yeah. give people an example. Thank you so much, Stephen Nelson, for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Um, so McClatchy argues, quote, from the translation found in the English Standard Version, it is easy to see how Ehrman came to the conclusion he did. And for some illiterate, uh, someone illiterate in the Greek, this mistake might be excusable. However, notice the jab here. <laughs> Airman is an expert. Yeah, I can't read Greek. Greek. I, I should learn that language sometime. <laughs> this is exactly what he says. He says, however, Airman is an expert in Greek, and so this mistake is quite inexcusable. The ESV translation of Luke 23, 46 says, following the tearing of the curtain, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. The English translation makes it sound like Jesus died following the tearing of the, the curtain. However, this is not at all clear in the Greek. The Greek word translated then is chi, which is a conjunction normally translated and. It is temporarily nonspecific, and ancient writers, including the New Testament authors, frequently used chi when narrating events achronologically, that is, without a respect to chronological sequence. Thus, both Mark and Luke are ambiguous as to the exact order of these events, and both are even consistent with the tearing of the temple curtain being simultaneous with Jesus' death. Would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I would like him to give me, let's say, three examples in Luke's passion narrative where he's, he's narrating events, one after another, and he uses chi, to show me that the second one happened before the first. Three other examples. Give me three other examples of that in Luke's account of Jesus' passion, where he's chronologically narrating what happened. He uses chi to separate one thing from another, and the second thing is understood to happen before the first thing. Give me three examples. Thank you, Dr. Ehrman. We'll go on to the next one. You heard that, so be on the lookout. <laughs> I feel like I'm I'm like Jerry Springer in the middle of uh, uh you know this uh this this match going on here. I'm just teasing. Not so, much of a match. I mean, the things he's saying. I mean, nobody agrees with. So, I mean, you know, it's right. nice and apologies to say it, but I mean, get it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. My friend Stephen Nelson, who knows biblical Greek, provided this reference from a biblical Greek textbook and noted the following about McClatchy's interpretation: uh, Luke surely has Jesus dying after the tearing of the temple curtain uh, because he dies after calling out with a loud voice and after saying his last words these are two successive aortis part participles which establish a clear sequence of events the tearing of the temple curtain and jesus last breath can't be happening at the same time in luke even if it were plausible reading in mark and matthew where those events are directly in sequence dr aaron do you concur with this analysis i don't think so because the uh if you could put the greek up again i can explain why yes sir let me pop that back up the issue is going to be that that 
um, our apologist friend is not basing this on the on the relationship between the participle and the verb that's governing it. He's basing it on the conjunction chi. Okay, I think this is it. So he's not saying he he. Um, Am I right here? Yeah. So what he's saying, what 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 your friend Steve Nelson is saying is that the phonesis. I think that's what he's saying. The phonesis has to happen before the apen. I'm sorry, uh, but do this in English. The calling out happens before the said, and uh, this after saying happens before breathed out, and that that is that's absolutely right, but that's not the uh, our apologist friend's argument. Right. His argument right. is that the and means that. Hold on a second. Oh, well, now that's interesting. Yeah. He's saying that all of verse two happened before verse one. Right. So it's not, so verse two is where you have those two participles that are dependent on main verbs. And he's saying he would agree with the sequencing within the verse, I assume, if he knows Greek, which I assume he does. Um, if, but he's saying that the and at the beginning of verse two doesn't mean that it happened next. It, it means, uh, uh, that, that verse two actually is happening before verse one. And I'm asking him, give me three examples of that. Awesome. Thank you so much. We did a lot of good slides here. I think these are wonderful for people to kind of keep track of. So, all right. Um, if the author huh. John wanted to convey, uh, yeah. sorry, Jesus miracles and John, this is, this is something interesting that, you, you made a comment on and he wrote about. So McClatchy quotes from Jesus and erupted. Jesus performs his first miracle in chapter two when he returns the water into wine or when he turns the water into wine, a favorite miracle story on colleague campuses. And we're told that this was the first sign that Jesus did. Later in that chapter, we're told that Jesus did many signs in Jerusalem. And then in chapter four, he heals the son of a centurion. And the author says, this was the second sign that Jesus did. Huh? One sign? Many signs? Then a second sign? This is uh, quoting you. McClatchy's objection is that the signs performed in Galilee were merely the first and second signs performed in that particular location, and that the other signs performed in Jerusalem don't actually count as signs performed in Galilee. And of course, in the image, you could see the comparison. If the author of John wanted to convey the idea that this was now the second sign that Jesus did in Galilee, why doesn't he just say that? How does McClatchy's reading hold up in like, uh, in in like of the phrase, when he had come from Judah, Judea to Galilee. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it depends how you want to translate the Greek here. Um, scholars have made a big deal of this thing that you've got the first sign and then the second sign, then signs in between the signs. And um, so that then really looks like the second sign. And it has to do, again, it has to do with how you translate a part of it, part of it. Um, In this particular case, my view is that what 5.4 is saying is this now is the second sign that Jesus did. Uh, he did this sign after he came from Judea to Galilee. But the emphasis is um, uh, that, that, I mean, it's true. These are two signs that he's done um, in Galilee. But, you know, even with, uh, I don't know if that made sense what I just said just now, but let me put it like this. Oh, put it, no, put it back up because I need it to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, yes, so, sir. If you read it the way he says you're supposed to read it, he's saying that uh, the first signs when he was in Galilee, does many signs in Jerusalem, second signs when he's back in Galilee. Right. Okay. But it actually doesn't say that. It says this is the second sign he did after having come from Judea to Galilee. But in his reckoning, it's the second sign. See what I mean? Yeah. Whereas in my way of reading it, he does the first sign, he does the many signs, and then the author, you know, it's a, it's a discrepancy. The author says this is the second sign, but he's just telling you this second sign was done, af done after he had come from Judea. So I don't have a discrepancy. I mean, the, the way I, it's really hard to explain this stuff without the Greek. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, okay, it's the, way you, it's the way you translate the participle. He ends up translating in a way that doesn't make sense of the word second. 
because he doesn't think this is the second sign he did after he came from Judea to Galilee. But the way he's translating the participle, it does mean it's the second sign he did after he came from Judea to Galilee. Because his first sign was just when he was in Galilee. Right. The beginning of his signs. Right. And how many women went to the tomb? McClatchy quotes Jesus interrupted. Who actually went to the tomb? Was it Mary alone? Mary and another Mary? Mary Magdalene? Mary, the mother of James and Salome? Or women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, possibly Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and other women. McClatchy points out the fact that Mary Magdalene says, we do not know where they've laid him in John 20, verse two. And he claims that this presupposes that other women were present with her at the tomb. So according to McClatchy, there is no contradiction here at all. And I'll pull up the image for you. And it is interesting. Me and my buddy uh, went over this last night. Like it's singular all the way to this very part. Like if you look at John 20 and you can, you know, you can compare all the synoptics, but in John 20, she saw that the tomb and then she ran and then she said, and then you get down here at the, the end and we do not know where they had laid him. He uses this little plural spot right here where we is to argue, oh, this right here is, you know, uh, evidence of a plural women at the tomb. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to do with these passages. Um, if what you're trying to do is to figure out a way to reconcile them, then this, this, is a way, this is a way to do it. It actually doesn't reconcile them because it doesn't tell, because the, as, you, as you can see, Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke don't all say the same thing either. Right. But it would allow uh, that Mary Magdalene went with somebody. Then you'd have to ask, why doesn't John tell you who the other one is? And if you only read up through, uh, she said, uh, so, she, so she, um, she saw that the tomb had been taken away from the, the stone had been taken away from. If you only read that far, what would you think had happened so far? You think that Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb, right? If he said she says we don't know where they have laid him. Um, if I were a fundamentalist, what I would say is. Uh, the, the reason she says we don't know where they've laid him is because she went off and first she conferred with her other with other people. They didn't know either. So she went to uh, Peter and said, we don't know. You see, if you, in other words, if you want to play that game, you could play it either direction. And so how do you know which one is right? Mm. So I choose not to play that game. And when when John says it's Mary Magdalene, so the deal with John is, as you as you probably know, John, like the other Gospels, is made up of lots of different sources, and there's lots of internal inconsistencies, partly because he's woven sources together, which is why you have that problem with the signs, and, and partly because uh, he's not careful in his editing. And so um, stories sometimes come from different sources, and when you do that, you get in inconsistency. Somebody could just as well say that this is an inconsistency, that the we is an inconsistency. Hmm. Thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. And we're going to move on to where was Jesus after the baptism? <laughs> you know, uh, all of these are McClatchy's uh, issues with with what you presented. And I, I figured it'd be great. I, I'm sorry that we're spending so much time. No, no, it's you. fine. You know, when I was a fundamentalist, I had the same kinds of views. So I, right. I, I understand. In fact, I had exactly these views. I, I understand them. Where was Jesus after the baptism? McClatchy quotes, Jesus interrupted. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the so-called synoptic gospels, Jesus, after, this, after his baptism, goes off into the wilderness where he will be tempted by the devil. Mark especially is quite clear about the matter of, uh, for he states, after telling of the baptism that Jesus left immediately for the wilderness. What about John? In John, there is no account of Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. The day after John the Baptist has borne witness to the spirit descending on Jesus as a dove at baptism, he sees Jesus again and declares him to be the Lamb of God. John is explicit, stating that this occurred the next day. Jesus then starts at gathering his disciples around him and launches into his public ministry by performing his mi miracles of turning water into wine. So where was Jesus the next day? It depends on which gospel you read. And of course, looking here, this is McClatchy's objection, quote, this then is not the baptism narrative itself, but rather John giving testimony to what had happened on an earlier occasion. Bart Ehrman once again has simply misread the text. 
end quote. I'm not exactly sure what McClatchy means by on an earlier occasion, if he means that this <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. That's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, you like this. <laughs> that's pretty funny. You want me to finish saying this or you want to go ahead and jump into it? No, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> okay, so if he means that this occasion was in fact Jesus' baptism, I suppose his interpretation makes sense. But if he's implying that the spirit descended from heaven like a dove on two separate occasions, then that seems a little odd. Do you think this is John's way of narrating Jesus' baptism without narrating the actual baptism, Dr. Ehrman? Um, so if you actually read the passage, <laughs> um, John 1.29, you have to start with John 1.29, where the passage begins. And it begins with, on the next day. And the next day, so John saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, behold, be, behold the Lamb of God. And he goes on to talk about Jesus. He begins talking about Jesus in verse, at the end of verse 29. He talks about him in verse 30. Uh, this is the one I meant when I said, continues talking about him in verse 31. Uh, I, I myself did not know him. Goes on, uh, verse 32. And John gave his testimony. I saw the spirit coming down upon him. Uh, he's talking about Jesus and Jesus coming to him to be baptized and Jesus being baptized. Chapter one, verse 29 to chapter 29, verse 34. The next word is the next day. So the next day is in relationship to the day that John was speaking. You'll notice that in verse 29, uh, and in uh, verse thir 35, it begins exactly the same way. In Greek, it's te eparion, on the next day. He's narrating a sequence of events day by day. On one day, he came to John. John, uh, John saw the spirit coming upon him. He told the others about it. The next day, Jesus, uh, Jesus calls his disciples, and it goes from there. Mm -hmm. No temptation in the wilderness. No 40 days away. I love this. I am very blessed to be able to sit here with you and learn and uh, get your insight on this. I so hope we could do this again. Here's another one. <clears throat> squeezing in everything we can. Guys, we're squeezing a camel through the eye of a needle right now, so please bear with us. Does Acts contradict Paul regarding his visit to Jerusalem? McClatchy pushes back against the idea that Acts contradicts Paul by claiming that Paul simply had no reason to mention all of the events in his itinerary. McClatchy quotes, Jesus interrupted, this emphatic statement that Paul is not lying should give us pause. He is completely clear. He did not consult with any others after his conversion, did not see any of the apostles for three years, and then he did not see any except Kephas, Peter, and J Jesus' brother James. This makes the account found in the book of Acts very interesting indeed. For according to Acts 9, immediately after Paul converted, he spent some time in Damascus with the disciples. And when he left the city, he headed directly to Jerusalem, where he met with the apostles of Jesus. On all counts, Acts seems to be at odds with Paul. Did he spend time with other Christians immediately, Acts, or not, Paul? Did he go straight to Jerusalem, Acts, or not? Paul. Did he meet with a group of apostles, Acts, or just with Peter and James, Paul? And so obviously you see in the slide, McClatchy asks, quote, now how long a period of time is denoted by many days? Get this. Take a look at 1 Kings 2, 38 through 39, McClatchy says, where many days in Hebrew is immediately glossed as three years, end quote. Dr. Ehrman? <laughs> So, okay, so, so let me ask, let me, me ask let me ask him this. Yeah, leave that up. Let me ask him this. The Septuagint is a translation of 1 Kings 2 that was done centuries after 1 Kings 2. The translation was not written by the author of 1 Kings 2. 1 Kings 2 says it was a long time. He doesn't put the Greek. He doesn't put the Hebrew there, so I don't know right. uh, who it is. Um, he says it's literally many days. I, I'm not going to bother to look it up in Hebrew right now. But, but the the translation of the Septuagint centuries later says three years, and so he says therefore many days means three years. 
And therefore, um, some days in Acts 9, uh, sufficient days, um, it actually doesn't quite say many, it's sufficient some days. Um, therefore, that might, might mean three years. Um, if I, if I just let me put it like this. Yes. Sir. Suppose, suppose I take a Greek verse in the New Testament, um, and for example, suppose I, um, uh, I don't know. Suppose I take a Greek verse that says "some days" and uh, in Greek, and I translate that into English with the phrase three years." Would you be able to use my English translation of the phrase? My translation is three years, even though the original said many days. Would you be able to use my translation to prove that the author meant three years? Right. You know, the Septuagint is, translation has no bearing on what First Kings said. <laughs> this is also another interesting fact. My buddy Stephen threw this in there, and I love Stephen for this because he's so anal about particulars. In Acts 27, in the same book later, you have um, Paul saying, We sailed, or it says, We sailed slowly for many days. Are we going to now interpret that to mean three years? Did he sell for three years? I mean, like, when do you stop? And it's the same Greek word, so in the same book, but he wants to run to the first Kings Old Testament narrative to find a way to squeeze three year three years into many days. That's what he's trying to do. My view on this is, you know, you can, as I was saying earlier, you can reconcile anything. I mean, I was, you know, if you if that's your goal, there there you can literally anything, not just in the Bible, just anything. You can do right. it if you work hard enough. And the question is, you know, why do you want to do that? Um, <laughs> So when I when I was a fundamentalist, that's what that was my goal because I, I was sure the Bible was inerrant, and since there are no mistakes, there could not be mistakes. Literally, there could not be, so there weren't mistakes, and so the goal was to figure out why it's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. If you want to understand the Bible, though, you should let these authors speak for themselves instead of forcing your meaning onto them. Um, when Acts says after some days, if it means three years. For one thing, the chronology of Acts doesn't work anymore. But moreover, it misses the point of Acts, which is right away, the first thing Paul did, he went to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles. This fits in with, with Acts' narrative because he wants the apostles and Paul to agree on everything. You also misunderstand Galatians because Galatians 1, the whole point Paul wants to make is, I did not get my message from them. I wasn't even there for three years. By God, I'm not lying. So, yeah, okay. If you want to mean make him say, well, actually, I did go there right away. You know, right after right after Damascus, that's where I went. You know, well, it was three years later. But it's like, no, he was in Arabia. And then, so you know, so you completely misunderstand what he's saying. You really want to misunderstand somebody so he doesn't contradict somebody else. You're misunderstanding both of them for the sole reason of supporting your view instead of letting them speak for themselves. Is that really how you want to interpret texts? I think you know how it is, Dr. Ehrman. You know, when you're when you, when you're coming at it, you say this in every book you write, and I love that about you. You just lay it out there and say, this was everything to me. And so it's like, like uh, the cognitive dissonance, knowing your wife's cheating on you, but you love her to death or something, and you just can't ad admit that there's possibly infidelity taking place. It's emotional. So I try to feel compassion and empathy, and you do too. You do it all the time in your lectures, but there comes a time when reality has to set in, and sometimes you just got to say, guys, figure out a way of Christianity that will work and comply with the evidence that will work with the reality of the world we see and not magical thinking. And so that's just my thoughts. But uh, he, he ends this and concludes by pointing out Luke's omission and Paul's itinerary, quote, but what about the trip to Arabia? Luke is silent on it. But does Luke contradict Paul's claim that he went to Arabia? I would place Paul's trip to Arabia within the many days of Acts 9.23. Paul also informs us in Galatians 1.17 that he returned again to Damascus. So it isn't surprising uh, then that he that his subsequent trip to Jerusalem is from Damascus. End quote. What do you think about the possibility that Paul took a trip to Arabia while the Jews in Damascus were plotting to kill him? Uh, well, I, uh, what do you say? I mean, just anybody, just read, just read it yourself. Acts, 
9, verses 22 and 23, does it seem likely to you that when he says that Saul was in Damascus talking to Jews and that after a few, after some days went by, does that, does that, that the Jews were plotting, does that suggest that between 22 and 23, he spent three years in Arabia? Does that, is that what makes sense? Okay. Interesting. Does Paul contradict Acts on the number of Jerusalem visits? This is the final graph. And then what I'd like to do is ask you a uh, really down to earth, funny. I think it's, it's just amazing what you've done with your book, Forge to Counter Forgery. Uh, all your literature is just wonderful. And I ask everyone to go in the description. If you have not read Dr. Ehrman's works, I, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Okay. I'm just saying, like, literally, this is just, yeah, I would not say that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, your audiobooks are fantastic too. Like, on Audible, any mm -hmm. trip I take, I listen to it. I can listen to them again and I learn something new every time. So, uh, final graph. And then my uh, excitement on recent stuff I read from you. And then I have to let you go because you obviously have a, another agenda here that's uh, taking place here soon. Um, does Paul contradict Acts on the number of Jerusalem visits? According to Paul, and I think he's quoting you here because um, the way we have it colored. According to Paul's account, the Jerusalem Council was only, was only the second time he had been to Jerusalem. According to Acts, it was his third prolonged trip there. Once again, it appears that the author of Acts has confused some of Paul's itinerary, possibly intentionally for his own purposes. McClatchy asks a rhetorical question. Where does the text say that this was only Paul's second visit to Jerusalem? McClatchy continues. In fact, we learned from Acts 11 that between those two journeys, Paul had gone to Jerusalem to bring aid to the saints affected by a famine. Famine. There would have been no purpose in Galatians for Paul to have mentioned this trip as it did not relate to conferring with the apostles about the gospel he was preaching, end quote. It seems like McClatchy's rhetorical question could be asked about his own assertion. Where does the text say that Paul's trip to send aid to Judea was between those two journeys? The one that Paul Paul actually takes care to mention. What do you think about his uh, apologetic strategy for harmonizing Paul and Acts? Well, I think it's very common. I mean, people do this. And, um, you know, Paul's goal in talking about this, I mean, you, you have to read these books, you have to read them and study and see them in the context. When you do that, Paul is trying to explain that he did not spend much time in Jerusalem. He's trying to tell the, and it's probably, we, it looks like he has opponents who are accusing him in Galatia. And it looks like they're saying, look, he's getting all this stuff from the apostles and he's changing it. You know, he's claiming you, you Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but he got his gospel from these Jerusalem people and they say you do. So, you know, he's changed. And Paul's trying to say, no, look, I haven't changed it. This is what Christ told me when he appeared to me. And I did not consult with them. I went there once after three years, and then I went back 14 years later. I didn't consult with them. So I'm mean, glad you wants us to think that Paul delivered this offering to Jerusalem and like he didn't look up the apostles. Really? And it's very hard to fit that collection, by the way, this early in Paul's minute, this is in Acts, this is af after his first missionary journey. It's quite clear when you read Paul, the Pauline letters. He's, his last letter, uh, Romans, is talking about when he's going to be going to Jerusalem. And so it's at the end of his life. It's not right at the very beginning of his ministry. So there are all sorts of problems with it. But again, look, if, you, what you, if your goal in life is to make sure there are no contradictions in the Bible, you can do that. You can do that with the Quran. You can do that with the Old Testament. You can do that with uh, any biography of Abraham Lincoln, if that's, that really is your goal in life. If, on the other hand, your goal in life is to understand these books, then I suggest you read them carefully and let each author say what he wants to say instead of pretending that he's saying what some other author is saying. I, final question, and I'm going to let you I, – I, I have to let you go because you have an appointment. We talked about this before the show, so thank you so much by, by this far, like – Dr. Ehrman, this has really been wonderful interviewing you and having the sure. opportunity. So you writing about forgeries, one of the funniest things you said in your forgery counter forgery book that just, I couldn't help but laugh because I, this was everything to me. This was like life, everything you, to you is James is our pseudo James is arguing against 
Paul in Ephesians, and neither one of them are really James or Paul. Yeah. yeah. That is so hilarious to me that these authors aren't really who they are, you know? Oh, well, yeah, it's kind of even more interesting that, than that in some ways, because, you know, it was uh, James and Paul, have always, since the Reformation, since Martin Luther, it's been thought that James uh, is opposed to Paul, um, and that the historical James, the brother of Jesus, was opposed to Paul. And there's very good reason for thinking that James did not write the letter of James. That, I mean, somebody named James wrote it, but not the brother of Jesus for reasons I map out at good length in, in my books. But the interesting thing is um, that they're, I don't think they're contradictory. And you, would, you, you probably would expect fundamentalists or evangelicals to think that I think that Paul and James are contradictory. I don't. Because I think that James, who is not the brother of Jesus, is actually conflicting with an interpretation of Paul that Paul himself did not have. Hmm. He's, con he's what he's contradicting is the understanding of Paul that you find in books like Ephesians that Paul did not write. And so he's attacking a, a view of Paul that Paul would not have recognized. Paul did not think that you were going to be saved without living an ethical life. But you weren't going to be you, you weren't going to be saved by living an ethical life. But if you are a follower of Jesus, of course, you're going to live an ethical life for Paul. James is attacking people who say it doesn't matter what you do. For Paul's letters, a third of each of his letters is telling people what they have to do. <laughs> so he, he really thinks it matters what you do. Uh, and so James is attacking someone else, and it's not Paul. <laughs> and so, wow. yeah. This yeah. leads us right into Dr. Jason Staples' work. I was, I'd love to get your thoughts on Romans 9-11. One sentence, what do you think about his work? Well, he was my student. He wrote this under my direction. This Did he convince my, you? Um, he came close to convincing me, <laughs> which is more than most of my students do. <laughs> there you go, Jason. I think, I think he makes it, look, I think he has a very impressive book that is a thorough study of what it would mean for somebody like Paul to say that all Israel will be saved. It's a really difficult verse. We all have our interpretations of it, but he has a very a novel and important interpretation. And so, I, and he, he knows a lot. About yeah, this. There's a lot about this. <laughs> Connect me with him. Connect me with him. Thank oh, no, you so no, just much. Write him an email. <laughs> Doesn't he oh, respond? Yeah. I am. He's a busy man too. You know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank All you right. So much, no, Dr. I really Aaron. enjoyed it. Okay. Great. You're the man, Thanks so much, man. and thanks everybody for listening in. We are vicious. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>